Arnie is back and more badass than ever in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Released in 1991, Schwarzenegger returns as the T-800 who is sent from a future war against machines. Only this time he's playing the good guy who arrives in early 90s LA to protect 10-year-old John Connor, played by Edward Furlong, who will grow up to be the leader of the resistance. But the T-800 isn't the only traveler from the future, as the T-1000 also arrives, played with delightful menace by Robert Patrick, an advanced liquid metal Terminator who is out to kill John Connor and will stop at nothing to do so. The T-800 and John team up with John's mum, Sarah Connor, played by Linda Hamilton, who, like the T-800, is more badass than ever, as they prepare for war in order to stop Judgment Day. In this sequel, who many claim not only surpasses the original, but is a spectacular masterpiece in its own right, and a movie that would change the course of filmmaking and define a generation. A movie that following films was strived to be like, but never reaching the same level of cinematic perfection that T2 did. Indeed, this movie was lightning in a bottle, of which the likes had never been seen before. So today, we are going to look into 10 things that you didn't know about Judgment Day. Number 10, The Abyss helped with the development of Terminator 2. In 1984, after the release of the original Terminator, it became very apparent to all those involved, including director James Cameron, that they had a surprise hit on their hands. Overnight, Cameron became a big time director and would go on to have further success directing Aliens, which was also a massive hit. However, over the years, there had been talks and whispers as well as fan appreciation for a Terminator 2. One person who was a huge advocator for a Terminator follow-up was Arnold Schwarzenegger himself. However, Cameron wanted to wait until the technology of the time caught up with his vision, as he knew that he wanted a sequel to feature a villainous Terminator who was made out of liquid metal and had the ability to morph, and that the effects of the time just weren't ready. That is until 1989 when Cameron directed the underwater science fiction movie The Abyss, which, by the way, is very underrated. The special effects of that movie were provided by the George Lucas-founded Industrial Light and Magic, and it featured a scene with an alien being made out of liquid, which had the ability to morph. And from that scene alone, Cameron knew that he could now create his vision of a terrifying menace of the future, made out of liquid metal who also has the ability to morph. So it would seem that now Terminator 2 was ready to start taking form, right? Well, wrong. Because unfortunately, there was also copyright disputes. Gotta love them copyright disputes. Number 9. Terminator 2 almost couldn't be made due to legal issues. Okay, so the famous story goes that James Cameron sold the rights to the Terminator for one dollar so he could direct the first film, as back then he wasn't a well-known director and no one really had much faith in him directing that movie. However, by the time Terminator 2 was on the cards, this led to the ownership of the Terminator brand to have a 50-50 split ownership between Hemdale Film Corporation and Corolco Pictures, with Hemdale facing financial troubles at that time, of which put the production of Terminator 2 into a legal halt. That right there could have been the end of the Terminator franchise. However, Arnold Schwarzenegger really believed in the movie and James Cameron's vision, so he convinced the head of Corolco, Mario Casa, to buy the rights to the Terminator outright from Hemdale, with Corolco co-producing the movie. So Corolco brought the remaining rights of Hemdale for $5 million. So now, with the legal disputes being put to rest, production on Terminator 2 could commence. Number 8. Casting so naturally, Schwarzenegger was on board to reprise his role as a cyborg from the future in Terminator 2. Arnie himself really wanted to play the good guy this time. In Terminator 2, he's kind of like the Reese Kyle character from the first movie, a soldier sent from the future as a protector. Schwarzenegger was originally cast as Kyle Reese in the first film before switching to the villainous Terminator role. So now landing the role of the heroic part was like a wish fulfillment for Arnie. 
His character as the T-800 actually goes for a story arc in T2, other than just being a machine, with the Terminator learning what it means to be human, which is an age-old concept when it comes to robots in fiction, as well as his character becoming a father figure to John Connor. Linda Hamilton also returned as Sarah Connor. Like the T-800, her character is significantly different, as she is now a tough war soldier, traumatized by the knowledge of things to come, and willing to do whatever it takes to change the fate of the future. And throughout the events of Terminator 2, she herself even sort of becomes a Terminator, willing to brutally kill in order to change the fate of things to come. For some scenes, Linda Hamilton's twin sister Leslie was used, which includes a sequence where the T-1000 disguises himself as Sarah, with the real Sarah in the background, and a cut scene where Sarah is operating on the T-800's head in front of a mirror. To achieve this effect, Linda was working on a puppet of Schwarzenegger, whereas Leslie was standing with the real Arnie. Or was it the other way around? Edward Furlong had never acted before. He was spotted at a boys' club in Pasadena by the casting agent. The casting agent saw him and offered him the role. Furlong said that he took part in a heap of screen tests until he finally landed the role. Furlong did a great job as playing the rebellious troubled youth and you believe that this kid would grow up to be a tough warrior. And Furlong never comes across as obnoxious or like a bad child actor. He's totally sincere in the role. In fact, in the 90s, he was the coolest kid ever and all the other kids wanted to be just like him. I mean, come on, the kid had his very own frickin' Terminator. Number seven, original vision for the T-1000. It was always planned for the T-1000 to have a slimmer, slender build, to contrast Arnie's more muscular, bound physique. And James Cameron originally envisioned 80s pop star Billy Idol for the part. In fact, early designs of the T-1000 depict Idol as the movie's famous baddie. However, when Idol got the call to audition, he had just been in a motorcycle accident, which nearly cost him his leg. So not being in a fit state, Idol had to decline the offer. Instead, Robert Patrick was cast, who was a rising star at the time, having previously had a minor role in Die Hard 2. And he had the right build that Cameron was looking for. Cameron also liked Patrick because he thought that he looked like a cat. Despite having a smaller build, Patrick's portrayal of the T-1000 is just as terrifying as the first Terminator, as Patrick could be very menacing. What also makes the character even more disturbing is that he could also be charming and approachable when needed, a strategy more effective than the T-800's more fuggish shoot-now approach in the first movie. Speaking of characters, it wouldn't be a complete cast exploration without mentioning the characters of Miles Dyson, who was played by Joe Morton an executive of Cyberdyne who gets access to the parts of the first Terminator, and thus will unknowingly cause the terrifying apocalyptic war against the machines in the future. This is an interesting character, as he's not an evil scientist, but a family man who thinks that he's working on a great cybernetic discovery, which will actually help mankind. But in actual fact, it'll do the opposite. But the character gets to redeem himself when he joins our main heroes to help destroy Cyberdyne, in order to stop the impending doom of things to come. And he does, as Dyson gives his life to try and prevent the events of his own creation, making him an important hero in T2. Number six, the special effects of Terminator 2. The shoot for T2 began in October 1990 and will last until March 1991, with filming taking place in locations such as the Mojave Desert and New Mexico, as well as several locations around California, including Los Angeles and the San Fernando Valley. And no, in that scene where the Terminator enters the bar, Arnie wasn't in his birthday glory, but was in fact wearing board shorts. T2 really pushed boundaries in terms of special effects and stunt work, giving audiences a spectacle for the likes that they had never seen before. Industrial Light and Magic really took special effects to the next level with their efforts in the movie, giving an example of CGI done right. Also on board to help with Terminator 2's movie magic was Stan Winston, who also worked on the first movie. He really outdid himself in terms of practical effects in T2. So much so, I would say that T2 is his masterpiece in terms of special effects. But that said, after T2, he also worked on the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, so maybe it's fair to say that T2 and Jurassic Park are his best works. Number five, the music of Terminator 2. The score for Terminator 2 sees the return of Brad Fiedel, who previously scored the first movie. 
Whereas the first movie sounded more synthesized, his score in Terminator 2 sounds more powerful and epic. He gets the action beats down perfectly, as well as the use of haunting music which reflects the end of the world. His theme for the T-1000 sounds terrifying, and almost like a synthetic metallic living organism itself. His main theme for Terminator 2 was so well received, it spent six weeks in the Billboard charts, reaching at number 70. Many have tried to replicate the sheer power and magic of Fiedel's music in Terminator 2, but just can't quite pull it off like he did. The movie also uses two famous songs, one of those being Bad to the Bone. At that stage, using Bad to the Bone in movies had become something of a cliché, as it was previously used in Christine and Problem Child. But despite this, it still feels fresh and original in T2, as it's often played as a sort of theme for Arnie's T-800 character, which actually goes really well with the character. The song best known for Terminator 2 is without a doubt the Guns N' Roses hit, You Could Be Mine. Before the Guns N' Roses song was picked, other songs were considered for the film, including I Wanna Be Sedated by the Ramones and Higher Ground by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. But it was supposedly Arnie who picked You Could Be Mine by Guns N' Roses. There was even a music video of You Could Be Mine, which featured the band playing at a concert, where the T-800 also attends to scope the place out. I always love the scene where Arnie comes face to face with the band. As a kid, I was watching it and I was like thinking, so is he gonna kill Guns N' Roses? But thankfully he didn't. As with Bad to the Bone, You Could Be Mine just goes perfectly with T2. Number four, The Lost Sequel. After the release of Terminator 2, fans were so blown away by the movie, they really wanted a sequel, despite the fact that T2 ends pretty conclusively. Terminator enthusiasts would have to wait 12 years to get Terminator 3. But what most fans forget is that there actually already was a direct sequel to Terminator 2, in the form of T2 3D Battle Across Time, which came out as an attraction shown at Universal Studios in 1996. The 12 minute feature was co-directed by James Cameron and saw the return of Arnold Schwarzenegger, Linda Hamilton, Robert Patrick and Edward Furlong, all reprising their roles, and it was made on a budget of $24 million. The feature looked cinematic and like it could have been plucked out of one of the actual Terminator movies. What I find interesting is that Edward Furlon had clearly aged since T2, with him now looking older. So it kind of gives an insight into what it could have been like had the sequel's productions rehired the actor for the part in later sequels. Sadly though, if you want to experience this adventure yourself, the attraction has since been removed from both the Florida and Hollywood Universal Studios. But it is still currently operating at the Japan Universal theme park. You see, here's the thing. Since the release of T2, many movies have come out which have now claimed to be the true sequel to Terminator 2. Where, in actual fact, T2 3D Battle Across Time is actually more like the actual direct sequel than those other attempts. When you think about it. Number 3. Action Figures Yep, you know it's the 90s when toys for kids are released that are based on violent R-rated movies. The Terminator action figures were released by Kenner, whom brought out most toys based on movies or TV shows back in the day, including Star Wars and the real Ghostbusters. And man, I loved these toys as a kid. I honestly really thought that they were awesome. Personally, I remember having the T-800 figure where you pull his arm down and his face and torso pops out to reveal his Terminator exoskeleton. I loved this figure, and I would walk around with it saying, I am the Terminator. Yeah, some of the toys didn't really make sense. Like, why is the T-800 wearing a pink top? Why does the T-1000 look nothing like Robert Patrick? And since when did the Terminator have a Terminator mobile? One that comes complete with a gas mask. I don't remember that from the movie. Why would the Terminator even need a gas mask? But it doesn't matter. You can't really look into it too deeply. They were still plastic awesomeness. I actually still have some of my T2 toys, as we've got John Connor here. Yeah, I never took him out of his packaging. I mean, I don't even know why I got him. I never wanted to be John Connor. I wanted to be Arnie. So, okay. And of course, we've also got this big beast. This thing is meant to light up and talk and make noises, but yeah, I don't really want to tamper with it too much because it's now like an antique, so he's just kind of staying in his box. However, you can take his sunnies off and yeah, it looks really, really creepy. Ew. Number two, extended version. 
So during the 90s, a televised version of Terminator 2 was broadcast, which featured scenes that weren't in the theatrical cut. Seeing these scenes for the first time was actually exciting. However, when Terminator 2 Judgment Day was released on DVD here in Australia, it only featured the extended edition, in a special DVD release that did not feature the original cut. And after a while, I felt like the extended cut wasn't needed, as the theatrical cut was perfect the way that it was. I'll admit it was interesting seeing Michael Bean return as Kyle Reese in a dream sequence, but once I had seen it and thought about it, I also felt like the character didn't really belong in T2. I also thought that a lot of the extra stuff was just padding that wasn't needed. Like, did we really need a scene of the Terminator trying to smile? Was it really required to make Terminator 2 better? Along with other scenes of the T-1000 snooping around. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I felt like it slowed the movie down. There's even a scene of the T-1000 killing the dog. Oh, come on, man, you don't kill the dog. I'm not against the extended cut, but I'm more of a fan of just watching it one time just out of curiosity to see unused footage of T2. But that's it. I never envisioned it as a replacement. The only extended scene that I personally think works is the scene where we see Miles Dyson at home, where we see he's a loving husband and father, which also explores him working on the cybernetics, where he honestly believes that he is working on an amazing breakthrough, making his prophecy of things to come even more tragic. Thankfully, as time has gone on, the original cut of T2 has finally become more mainstream again. For the longest time, the only version made available to purchase was the extended cut. The only way you could watch the original in all its glory was in good old-fashioned VHS. Hey, get back in there. However, one scene which didn't make it into the extended cut was an alternative ending, which is set in the future, where an elderly Sarah Connor is talking into her voice recorder at a park, where John, who is now middle-aged, is playing with his own child. This was to certify that the future is safe and the war with Skynet never happened. I don't know, the look of this scene just feels a bit off compared to the rest of the film. This future world in Terminator 2 looks more like something from Back to the Future's 2015 and Back to the Future 2. But regardless, it was decided to end the movie in a more ambiguous way, by it not being made definitively clear if the future is saved. And look, if anyone does like this ending, that's fine. But to me personally, I find it a little bit fairy tale ish And to me, Terminator isn't a fairy tale, it's a tragedy. But I guess it's all about tastes and perspectives. That said though, had the movie ended with this scene, then there wouldn't have been any more not up to scratch sequels. Number one, the most expensive movie of its time. Terminator 2 Judgment Day was the most expensive movie ever made for its time, with a budget of about $102 million, which was just a whopper for that era. So there was a lot counting on T2 being a hit, which thankfully it was, as it would go on to make over $509 million at the box office, becoming the highest grossing movie of 1991. And everyone loved this movie, fans and critics alike. Thanks to the special effects, stunt works, script, and acting performances, it has gone on to frequently be regarded as one of the greatest movies ever made, and is still just as popular now as it was 30 years ago. It would also go on to win five Academy Awards in 1992, and many attempts have been made to replicate the magic of T2, but it seems that no one can quite recapture the lightning in a bottle that James Cameron had created back in 1991. It's a testament to movie making and storytelling, exploring many philosophies, as well as how impressive action set pieces can be. It may have been an expensive movie to make, but you can clearly see every cent of the budget being put on screen for good use. Terminator 2 is a testament to the art of cinema, and it proves that sometimes taking a gamble pays off when it comes to the fate of filmmaking. As the movie itself states, there is no fate but what we make for ourselves. And oh boy, did they make a good one with Terminator 2. At this stage, I think it's safe to assume that nearly everyone on the planet knows about Terminator 2. It's been a wonderful and glorious 30 years of having this movie to go back to, as it never stops blowing audiences away with how spectacular it is. And, let's be honest, it will continue to do so. Anyway, I'm Minty and I'll be back for another episode, of course. See ya!